take that. Okay, thank you for your analysis there, Akane Inatsu, who is Senior Credit Analyst at Barclays Capital. And still to come, assessing the risk of a disaster in Japan, what advice the company is taking, details straight ahead. The Daiichi plant. Tepco, the plant operator, meanwhile, hopes to restore power at the plant to more effectively inject water to cool the reactors. CNBC's Alison Brown has more. Japan took unprecedented measures to cool the stricken nuclear facility at Fukushima. Helicopters dumped seawater onto reactor number three. Officials say they grew concerned about continued smoke and steam emanating from that unit. The top priority is to cool down the uh, storage pool for nuclear, uh, for spent nuclear fuels for number three, number four units. So the second priority is to restore power supply and part of this operation is going to start this afternoon. Overnight comments by EU and US officials cause more nervousness in the markets. One has to be basically concerned that the whole thing is in God's hands and therefore there can be in the next hours catastrophic developments. But the EU energy chief spokesperson later played down his doomsday scenario, saying Ottinger had no specific knowledge on the situation. U.S. Energy Chief Stephen Chu also added to the growing concern, calling the stricken Fukushima plant a partial meltdown. I think the, um, the events unfolding uh, in the Japan uh, incidents um, actually appear to be more serious than Three Mile Island. To what extent, we don't really know now. But the physics Nobel Prize winner also pointed out that a partial meltdown did not mean containment systems had failed. Even before those alarm bells were sounded, those who could were scrambling to leave Japan. While some have the luxury of taking a precautionary measure of leaving Japan, it's a very different story for hundreds of thousands of tsunami survivors in Sendai. With little food, water, or heat and near freezing temperatures, they've got bigger problems to deal with. Allison Brown for CNBC. Well, let's get back to the markets with Sachel Patel. Uh, you're looking at the Nikkei for us. I believe it's just up below the 8,900 level. Yeah, that's right, Karen. Look, we have an hour and a half left in these markets. And what's interesting is, is even in the last 20 minutes, we're starting to see a little bit of weakness coming back into these markets, a little bit of hesitation because that market was off by 1.7% about 20 minutes ago. And obviously now it's down 2.1%. But you're right, it's off, uh, well off the uh, session lows. And I think part of that has to do with at least some hope that they're getting this uh, radiation uh, nuclear situation under control. We know the helicopters are pouring water over nuclear reactor number three. Three. Having said that, uh, weakness pretty much across the board when we when we look at the stocks and especially the exporters, which are grappling with another problem, and that is of course the surge in the yen. Uh, we saw dollar yen was drop something like four percent in uh, U.S. trading. Certainly after hours, you have a number of stop losses being triggered. Seventy six twenty five is where it was. Slight recovery as you can see up one point eight percent and around uh, seventy nine oh six right now. But again, it is still very week and and that's uh, really why we're seeing a big sell-off in the uh, Japanese markets meantime let's take a look at the rest of Asia as well because we are seeing a lot of weakness as you can see right across the board Kospi is down 0.7 uh, percent Hang Seng off by 1.8 percent you see uh, some of the heavyweights like HSBC China mobile very weak Shanghai is probably one of the better performers and that's because we know that China uh, saying that they're going to halt uh, plants for new nuclear uh, plants and and so alternative energy stocks or the oils, the wind powers are actually uh, attracting some investor interest. So that seems to be supporting the market. And as you can see, ASX basically flat, recovering from a six-month low. Karen, I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Angel. Well, I want to revisit the currency story now because we have seen some extreme volatility when it comes to dollar yen rates. In fact, you had to get up pretty early morning here in Asia to trade some of that volatility. Most of it coming before 6 a.m. this morning when we saw levels of 76 and a quarter. We've climbed back up to the 79 level to, um, this currently this afternoon here in Asia. And you can see the extent of the gains, but also on the other major currencies, euro dollar, euro yen, there have been some strong moves too. Let's get more on this with Dan Perry, who is Managing Director at FXCM Australia, joining us live from the Sydney. Mikio Kamada still with us, our guest host today, Executive Director at LGT Capital Management. And Dan, 
Talk us through some of those swings we saw first up this morning. Uh, it seemed to be speculators in there. We've heard reports from Japanese authorities that it wasn't some of those insurers repatriating funds. Do you think we could revisit those 76 and a quarter levels? Well, at this moment, anything's really possible. I think, you know, it's really hour to hour, you know, as we're talking about it. I think this morning what you saw was largely a speculative move. Um, the 80 level's been discussed now all week, and largely that's because we knew there were a lot of stops underneath there. We knew there was a lot of order flow. Uh, I think what you have to look for is the speed with which the market did go down to, uh, you know, really 320 pips down to that, uh, you know, uh, 76.50 level. That happened within uh, 30 minutes. And so if you look at the acceleration the move had, it really tells you that there was... It was largely speculative, um, not really defended too much by the Bank of Japan from, from what you can tell, but it's very difficult given all that's happening. Uh, can it happen again? It's, it's definitely possible. I don't see it happening with that level of acceleration. Uh, we were also hitting all-time highs for the end, don't forget, uh, which has a significant psychological effect as well as traders you know, really pile on that. There didn't seem to be many bids in the market. Um, it was really just you know similar to a stock market. So if this was a stock, you might have seen curbing uh, on the selling pressure because there was really no bids uh, coming in and we saw that it did uh, immediately yeah. thereafter or within several hours bounce back. Interesting point on liquidity because it was late US time, early Asia time. Uh, Mikio, for me, this was the equivalent of what we saw on markets, equity markets on Tuesday with that speed of that sell-off in the currency. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, but thankfully the currency situation is much more under control uh, to use a word that is slightly overused perhaps um, because the currency movements actually haven't been very very globally not very very um, volatile. Um, jump into this conversation and uh, pitch one to Dan for us. Dan, um, I have a question about the, your medium to longer term view. Obviously the yen uh, now tends to be on the stronger side of things. People rightly or wrongly expect repatriation. There is a historic precedent but what is your, your medium term view on the yen? Um, my medium term view is we could still see more repatriation. I mean, the, the nuclear element is really the X factor here. I mean, obviously this is a very unfortunate story from the beginning with the initial earthquake, the tsunami. Uh, but if it ended there, uh, I'm not so sure that dollar yen would have broke 80, to be honest with you. I think uh, it's the, this nuclear factor that we're really monitoring, uh, it seems, hour to hour. Uh, you know, we have helicopters flying over, dropping, uh, you know, water on the, on the plants uh, repeatedly. And it's that uncertain element. And when you look at traders in the market, whether they're talking about currencies or what have you, they don't know much about how to control a nuclear disaster, let alone, uh, you know, the layperson. So I think that's really what's causing that uncertainty. Um, what you also have is unwinding of risky assets. And so uh, equity markets around the world are also underperforming. Uh, so that's resulting in people hitting margin calls and, ha and, and just, you know, looking for liquidity uh, in other markets.